My name's Paul Acon. I'm a law lecturer here at the UNE School of Law. And one of the units that I, that I teach is advocacy. And we teach that in this here, this what we call moot court, which in many respects is a, a replica of an actual court. So if you've never been in a courthouse or a courtroom, and you go, you'll see that this pretty well mirrors exactly what you'll see in, uh, in a courthouse. Just a bit of background for you. The, in our system, what we call the common law system, for those of you that have done some legal studies, you'll know about the common law system. There has always been a division between, in the legal profession, between what we call the advocates, who are the barristers, and the solicitors the solicitors and the barristers. And the barristers are the ones that you see often in the news reports and one thing and another who wear the wigs and the gowns. And uh, they are specialist advocates. It doesn't mean that you can't be an advocate also as a solicitor, but the tendency still is that the specialist advocates are the barristers and they're the ones that wear the wigs and the gowns. Now that arose back in about the 17th century in England when most people were illiterate and whenever they received any sort of legal document and they needed some form of explanation or advice or one thing or another, they would go down to what they called the inns of court. Now an inn is another name for a hotel or a pub and around the courts in uh, London, particularly then in those days, were these inns. And these specialist advocates used to sit around in those inns waiting for clients to come to them for special advice and also for uh, appearing on their behalf in court. And that's um, why we call those barristers now, members of the bar. And they are still called to this day, the bar. So barristers are members of the bar, whereas solicitors are not. They're not members of the bar. And in those gowns, if you look at them closely, if you ever get close, up close to them, you'll see in the back there's a little pocket. And the clients used to put their fee in that little pocket in the back of their gowns. And you'll see that when you see gowns that the barristers wear, they still have that as a part of the tradition of the sort of gowns they wear. Now the junior barristers, their gowns are generally made from cotton or some such sort of fabric. But the senior barristers, who they used to call QCs or KCs, that's Queen's Council or King's Council. And now in Australia, they're called in New South Wales, Senior Council. They wear silk gowns, silk gowns, and that's why they're called silks. So if you want to brief a silk, you'll often hear that said, that's a senior barrister, an SC, or in Victoria at the moment a QC, because we've got a Queen in England. If the Queen, if she uh, ultimately um, is replaced by Prince Charles, they'll become KCs, King's Council. They are the, they are the top of the tree, so to speak, so far as advocates are concerned. All right, any questions about that? Do you want to ask? Okay. Now there's lots of traditions and lots of um, protocols that relate to the law, the way we practice it in Australia. And some of them are very, very strict, really strict. But before we go there, I think it's important that we just have a look at what, the, what makes up a court, okay? So this here, do you know what that's called, where the barristers or the solicitors sit in terms of their court appearances? The bar. The bar, that's right, the bar table. So this is the bar table, this is, and the barristers sit at the bar table because they're members of the bar. So they're entitled to sit, as a matter of right, to sit at the bar table. Now solicitors can do it, but in the superior courts you tend to find it's generally always 
just barristers. And where you're sitting is often where the instructing solicitors sit and they provide the instructions to the barrister. They do all the, the paperwork, so to speak, whereas the barrister does all the advocacy. Okay, so every appeal court particularly, and most other courts, have one of these on the bar table. Do you know what this is? <laughs> it starts with L. Lectern, correct. So this is a lectern, all right? So you'll always have, and they are really, really handy, lecterns. Really handy, so because it means that when you stand at the lectern and you are addressing the court, it means it's very close to you eye-wise, you can still keep your eyes straight up. So, what's this called up here? The bench. The bench, that's right. Sometimes you'll have just one person sitting on the bench, a judge or a magistrate, and that can be a man or a woman. There's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no gender bias on the bench. Often though, when it's an appeal court, that is when somebody's appealing a decision that's been handed down by a lower court, there will be three judges on the bench. So hence the three seats here, all right? And then it can be five seats or seven, and I think that's the, um, I think the High Court at the moment has seven or nine. So if you go look at the High Court bench, and you'll see it's almost like a little uh, semicircle, and each judge there is the, that's the highest court of the land. What do you think this is here? Who would sit here in a court? Any thoughts? They used to say 12 good men and true, but now they say 12 good people and true. The jury, correct. So the jury sits here and they decide on the questions of fact that are before the court. Over here, what do you see here? What's this? The witness box, correct. So every court will always have a witness box. And it's quite funny, even in even appeal courts, they often still have a witness box, even though they don't usually call witnesses because they're arguing about questions of law. So this is the, this is the witness box. Now that is said to be one of the loneliest places in the world. One of the loneliest places in the world. If you are in that witness box, uh, you are really alone, you can be protected a little bit by whoever's representing you, but otherwise it's a very, very lonely place. So you've got to tell the truth. And normally in the witness box, they have a Bible, a Holy Bible, and they also have a Quran. So people, when they swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, they do it on the, the uh, the text that they, uh, they choose, but they also may choose to make what they call an affirmation if they don't have any belief, but they still affirm before the court that they will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if it's found out, discovered that they haven't told the truth, then do you know what it's called when you tell lies? It's a very serious criminal offence to tell lies in the witness box? On the tip of your tongue, is it? Perjury, perjury is correct, so yeah. So if ever you have to give evidence, and I hope you don't, uh, always remember that it's really important to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Leading off every bench is a bench door, so that the judges or the judge can come into the courtroom without having to mingle, so to speak, with anybody in the gallery or the members of the profession. They're quite distinct and, and uh, separate. But there's always a separate door for the bench to come in. The legal practitioners and the gallery, they come in through a separate door, which is down there, where you came in earlier. That's a separate door for the, um, for the legal practitioners. We don't have it here, but also a jury has a separate door for obvious reasons. So they don't have any contact with the profession, the public, the bench or anybody. They are completely and they're in, they're in the hands of what we call the sheriff. 
The sheriff normally sits at one of these seats here. Um, they don't have police officers in the courts, they have sheriff's officers. Police can come along obviously as witnesses and one thing or another, but they're not part of the court system. And also the judge's associate will sit in, in one of these seats. And in the um, a scheme of things, there's also what we call a court reporter. A court reporter. So everything is transcribed, uh, fully transcribed. Let's have a look at some of the um, protocols, some of the traditions and conventions. Probably the one that's most important is bowing. There's lots of bowing that goes on in court. So. When you come into this door here, if the court is already sitting, that is to say, if the judge or the magistrate is on the bench, as soon as you reach the door and you open the door, you bow like that. It doesn't have to be like right down like that, but you just acknowledge that the, you face the bench and you bow, all right? Now, a lot of people say, I don't want to bow to the magistrate, you know? You're not actually bowing to the magistrate. What you're bowing to is this, the coat of arms. And you are acknowledging that the power of the court through its judicial arm. People don't just walk in and out. It's not just like a retail shop where people walk in and out the door. There's, it's the first acknowledgement you make that serious things happen in court. Bowing is important. There's a little bit more sort of elasticity or uh, judges and magistrates are a little bit more um, sort of, how could I say it, lenient with members of the public, but with members of the profession, they have to observe that particular protocol of bowing when they come in and bowing uh, when they go out. And it does, it, ha it does have, sets the right it sets the right tone because, as I said, serious things happen in court and a lot of people take this for granted. You've got people sent to prison, people lose their freedom, um, people lose their kids, uh, people have large fines imposed upon them. All sorts of things happen in court that are very serious and so the idea is that you, you maintain this sense of seriousness by having these, these little customs uh, and practices and conventions. So that's the public and maybe the legal profession when they're walking in and out. So what I'd like you to do is to move up to the bar table here and sit down at the seats. Now this is interesting here too because there's another convention here that, 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 that follows and that is to, Council that sits closest to the lectern is senior council. So your senior council, your senior council. Senior council that is on the left as you are facing the, the bench is for the appellant or the plaintiff. And the legal team on this side of the lectern is for the respondent or the defendant. Okay? Now, uh, when the bench arrives and comes in, what happens is that either if it's a magistrate, the magistrate does it himself, he or herself, knocks on the door and says the words silence, all stand please. That means you immediately stand up, you stop any chit chat and you face the bench. Everybody else stands up too in the, in the whole court and there's dead silence. Okay, the bench, in this case there's only one judge moves to the middle of the bench there and stands and faces you. The bench will bow down, so the bench bows first, will bow down and bow to you. Now the bench is not bowing to you personally but bowing to the bar table and acknowledging the customs and traditions that have developed over hundreds of years of the common law between the bench and the bar. So the bench will bow like that, and then you will bow, the bench will sit down, and then you will sit down. Can you remember that? Because we're going to do it now.
All right? So I'll go out, I'll knock on the door, and I'll say the word silence, all stand please. And then you <coughs> will stand up and face me. I will go to the centre seat there. I will face you and bow, you bow, and then we all sit down. Okay? <coughs> Silence, all stand please. That's right, good, well done. So that's another little tradition or convention. People say, oh, you know, all this bowing and we're stuck with it as I said, because these things have developed over hundreds and hundreds of years and they're not going to change. So it's no use trying to buck the system. You've got to do it. If, for instance, you want to address the bench, you always stand up. You never, ever address the bench when you're sitting down. So the bench is sitting down, but you as an advocate, you always have to stand up. Now, if senior counsel for the respondent is in mid-flight in relation to some particular, and you want to, say, raise an objection, you have to stand up and say, well, I object. As soon as she stands up, you've got to sit down. Can't have two standing up at the same time. All right? Another little convention or protocol that we have, and you can see the sense of it, the common sense of it, you know, when you think about it, you can't have the whole bar table standing up at one stage because they're all trying to say something. Yeah? As soon as he sits down, can he stand back up again? No, he's got to stay down until the bench deals with you. Now, your, your, your objection may be completely out of order yeah. and the bench might tell you that and ask you to resume your seat, in which event, as soon as you sit down, then he can get up. Yes, yeah. So there's only supposed to be one person standing up at any one time. Now the other thing, there's another nice little conventional practice and that is you always say to the bench if you're on a pleasers when the judge will say something. So if the judge for instance says uh, I, um, I find um, the um, defendant um, is, uh, I, have, I find the prosecution has not proved uh, their case beyond reasonable doubt, therefore the charge is dismissed and the prisoner is to be, um, the prisoner is to be uh, freed. Now, the prosecution, which is you, would be very unhappy about that because they think the defendant's got away with something that they should have been convicted for. You say, if you want to please us. All right? If you want to please us. Defence will be delighted that they've got their uh, client off, so to speak, discharged. They don't say thank you. They say, if you're on a pleasers. You both say, if you're on a pleasers. You with me? Yeah. So there is a neutrality about your response. Because if they say thanks, thank you, Your Honour, next time round, the bench might say, find the client guilty. Well, they can't say thanks. What are they going to say then? So you say the same thing, good, bad or otherwise. And that keeps you, you know, completely out of trouble so far as the etiquette of the court um, is concerned. Now, another thing that's really important in relation to court is court dress as an advocate. And we spend a lot of time on that in uh, the unit that I teach, informing students that it's really, really important. Now, for men, it's a suit, preferably a dark suit, uh, with their tie done up to the collar, not like this, you know, some of them come, come like this, you know, to the, that's hopeless. Some judges Will, will refuse to see you. They'll say, I can't see you, Mr. Acon, because your tie's not done up properly. 
So you've got to do your tie, you've got to have your tie done up properly and some of them say, oh, you know, I, um, I don't wear a tie very often and the last time I wore this, um, this shirt, I had, um, I put on a lot of weight, you know, and I can't. You can buy, you can buy a shirt down at an op shop for about two or three dollars, decent shirt for court. It's covered mainly by your coat, but you've got to have your tie done up, all right? For women, it's the same level. It's usually a, a dark dress or a skirt and a top or pants. You can wear, allowed to wear pants now. No open flesh. So you have a blouse all the way down, done to your sleeves like a, a man's shirt. And most women will also wear a jacket unless it's really, really hot. But generally speaking, that's the, that, that, that's the sort of thing. And you know, I mean, some students, despite what we've, what we've talked about in lectures, they turn up as if they're going to a nightclub. In fact, I had one student once, you know, when I talked about this at the end of the moot, and she got up and paraded around and told me she'd spent $600 buying this dress and she was three months pregnant and went on and on and on and on. And I thought, oh no, you know, this, is, this would be terrible if it happened in court, you know, because it was just totally inappropriate. It was the wrong dress to wear to court. And judges take it seriously. A very dear friend of mine, in nine, you know, when just after the family law court came in and it was supposed to be all friendly and people were going to sit around and resolve all their differences and one thing or another, 1975, he went up unexpectedly to court. He had a pair of grey pants on and a, um, a blue jacket tie, the whole thing, looked very neat. He announced his matter, handed up some terms of settlement and when he was going out, the associate followed him. And um, she said, oh, Mr. Reckness, there's a note from the judge. And he opened up the note and the note said, next time you come to my court, wear a suit. <laughs> I mean, they take it seriously. They take it seriously. Another lady uh, was telling me, the wife of a, of a uh, lady here, who uh, one of my colleagues here from uni, she was at the ACT Supreme Court. A similar thing happened. She was um, at the office and she didn't expect to go to court and she had, I think they used to call them collots, but these pants that go at, you know, halfway down your, halfway down your shin bone and a nice top and one thing and another. And she was asked to do something unexpectedly. She went to court and a Supreme Court judge said, don't come back to my court like that ever. Either wear pants, proper pants or a dress or a skirt, but don't wear those, what you got on there. And there was one down here recently where a, um, a, um, a, a solicitor turned up to, uh, to court and it was winter time and he had his suit on and he had a polar neck jumper on, not a polar neck, a turtle neck jumper, and he didn't have, his, um, he didn't have a tie on underneath. And um, one of his colleagues, one of his yeah, colleagues and a colleague now of mine, said to him, have you got a tie under there? He said, oh no, the magistrate will never be able to see if I've got a tie or not. First thing that happened when he got up and said, I represent Mr. So-and-so, the magistrate said, Mr. Solicitor, have you got a tie on? Uh, no, Your Honour. Sorry, I can't see you. So he had to trudge out of court and bow, <laughs> go to the office, get his tie, <laughs> come back. So, I mean, these are true stories. And it's just to give you an example of how serious, and as we said before, serious things happen. So, what I'd like to do with you now is just give you a little exercise that we give to the students. This is um, for senior counsel of both teams that I'll give you a printout for each of you. So a little while ago we did the sitting of the court, all right? With the bench coming in, you standing up, standing down. Well, we wanna, I wanna go to the next step now. Your going to be Rumpole, okay? Rumpole, yeah, my name is Rumpole, okay? And I appear as senior counsel for the appellant, all right? In the blue, if you read the blue. Yeah. All right, so what you will do, you can put it, when you just familiarise yourself with it and then you can put it, take it up and put it on the lectern when you stand up. I'm all the blue. You're all the blue there. Well, we'll do this together and yeah. then you'll do this, yeah. all right? And then you'll say, you're, um, you with me? Yeah. Okay. 
And then what we'll do is also, because there's only one side here, we'll have senior counsel on the other side say the same thing. But you're appearing for the prosecution. I appear for the prosecution, all right? Yeah. And you're appearing for the defence, all right? So it may not be there, but if you can remember that, you're, 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 you're appearing for the defence. So that's just an extract out of the study guide. So we'll go back and do the same thing. I'll knock on the door and I'll say the words silence or stand, please. And then I'll come in, I'll stand and face you. You'll be facing me. I'll bow, you bow, and we all sit down. Right? And then I'll say yes to you. You'll come stand up. Put your notes down here on the lectern and you'll read what you've got there. My name is Rumpel. Yeah. And then I'll say to you, when she sits down, I'll say yes to you and we'll use the same. What's written there in the blue? You with me? Do you want to ask any questions? Do I spell this? Yeah. Please. Because without being, without being, um, without being seen to be... Uh, in any form critical. Sometimes the the courts, the courtrooms are not very the acoustics are not very well. Yeah. And sometimes the judges, their hearing's not so good. <laughs> and uh, if you don't get it right from the beginning, then it goes onto the record and it'll go all the way through yeah. and it'll be very difficult to correct. So that's why it's important. And it's also difficult to distinguish sometimes between miss Mrs. and Ms. So that's why you say, you can choose what you like, but you need to spell that too, whatever you are. Yeah. All right? This is the way you're doing what level four students do now, so that's pretty good. <coughs> Silence, all stand please. Yes. My name is Rumpole, spelled R-U-M-P-O-L-E, Your Honour, Miss, M-I-S-S, and I appear as Senior Counsel for the Appellant, with my learned junior, Miss Chelsea Thornton, C-H-E-L-S-E-A-T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. Okay, that's good. It's just one little thing. You don't have to give the first name. I don't know. It's, it's only the surname. Oh, okay. It's only the surname, just Thornton. Okay. And it's not a double name, is it? No. no. no yeah. So you just, you, it's Rumpole and Thornton. Okay. They only go by the surnames. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rumpole. Thank you. Yes, for the defence. Oh, there is no defence. My name is Rumpole, spelled R U M P O L E. You're on Mr. I appear as senior counsel for the de for the defendant with my learned colleague, Mr. Green, G R E E N. Yes, thanks, Mr. Rumpole. See now, you can see there why it's important because sometimes Green is spelled G R W -E, e N E. Yeah. Um, and if it if it if it you know you can a mistake can occur unless senior counsel when they make yeah, mate. Yeah, that's right. It's it's very, and that's why it's so important at that beginning. But that's very good. That's the way it starts, and then the the the, uh, the case uh, proceeds from there. Is there anything that um, you'd like to um, ask in relation to what uh, we've done this morning? Any? Have you got any questions that you'd like to ask? Okay. So circle sentencing is really really important. Uh, we've got a circle here in, um, in Armidale and it comes about as a result of the traditions of the Indigenous people when they used to circle, sit in a circle, the elders used to sit in a circle uh, when they used to come to a decision as to how they're going to deal with somebody that had done something wrong. And what circle sentencing tries to do is to employ that tradition but there are a few extra people involved. What happens is the elders have to come to the magistrate and say, we want to form a circle. And the magistrate has to be in agreement with it. I don't think the uh, uh, magistrate is obliged to, but I think in all instances they have. 
It started in Kayama in about 2003, I think. And there was a really interesting case involving there, involving circle sentencing, where a young uh, tearaway guy had got himself into trouble and they started this circle sentencing uh, procedure and the magistrate agreed to be there and the prosecutor was there. I don't think the um, defence counsel goes, but they may. And uh, anyway, the magistrate was just absolutely blown away by the vehemence and the way they got stuck in the, the circle, got stuck into this young fellow, absolutely, and said things to him that the magistrate said he would never, he would never think of saying, you know, in, a, in an open court. But because it was a circle and it was their, you know, their community, they, anyway, they discovered during the course of the discussion that took place that this young fella didn't know how to uh, fish in the traditional way because they were coastal community. And this, this was a big, a big thing, dishonour on his part. So they persuaded the magistrate to adjourn the matter for I think it was three or six months and the elders organised for somebody to teach that person, that young fellow, to, um, to fish in the traditional manner. Now, she did, they didn't tell us at the time at the time when they made this presentation what the result was, but you anticipate that the result was, was he wouldn't have been sent to jail or something like that as long as he turned up and learnt the proper way to fish according to his, his traditions. A lot, of the, a lot of the sentences that the circles give out are heavier and more onerous than what the magistrate would give out. Um, they happen after a plea of guilty and there's a tendency, I think, there may even be a rule that it's only juveniles. I'm not sure whether they, they might take some young adults, but it, certainly juveniles, yeah. Um, and by all accounts, it seems to work pretty well from what, I, from what I understand. There was an interesting situation down in Tamworth where the magistrate, I appeared down there when I was in the, doing a locum for the Aboriginal Legal Service. And the magistrate down there was very, very compassionate and very generous and he had a real strong feeling for Indigenous people. And he wanted to form a circle. So the, the magistrate wanted to form a circle. But there was a feud going on between the Camilleroy. The, the Camilleroy of the East and the Camilleroy of the West were not getting on. And as I said at the beginning, one of the, one of the ways that it happens is that the elders have to come to the magistrate. So he had a magistrate that really wanted to go have circle sentencing but the elders couldn't um, agree on it. So I don't think, I'm not sure if they've, you know, organised it since then. Does that give you a bit of an idea? Yeah. Oh, there's another little story about it too, which was good, this lady from Kayama, this, uh, she said that they, they went to Cam or Yass, they went to Yass to see if they could organise it there, a circle, to get a circle up and running there. And they said at the beginning of the presentation, because they, you know, they put a, a, um, a message out on the Koori network and about you know 20 or 30 people turned up and they said right at the beginning this is not a paid job it's not a government job this is for the benefit of our young people so if you think it's a paid job you might as well get up and leave now and she said about half the people got up and left but they knew that the ones that stayed were genuinely interested in you know the circle circle sentencing so I thought that was an interesting thing that she told that story too. No more questions. No more questions. All right. Well, we might give that, um, give it a. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.